Sure. So please join me in welcoming today's speaker and my longtime colleague, Dr. Eric Green. Thank you, Andy. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Andy may have mentioned, um, in week one of this series, uh, the, the series actually started uh, with, with Andy and I, and then eventually bringing Tara Wolfsburg into um, this picture. I was starting back in 1995. This is like the 12th time I've given some version of this lecture. Um, I should have, by the way, immediately thank Tira and Andy for organizing uh, this iteration of it, the 2016 version. They, they included my name on that, which was very kind of them. It's purely honorific. I really had nothing to do with organizing this, and you should thank them for all the logistical aspects of bringing this year's series together. Um, I, I, I'm more of a legacy left as a named uh, uh, co-organizer. Um, but it is, a, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I will say that uh, the title of my presentation sort of is very broad with genomics and the genomics landscape as I see it today. I will point out I'm going to emphasize heavily the human uh, genomics landscape um, uh, for reasons that will become pretty obvious, but I'm going to limit this a, a little bit, especially uh, towards the end. Um, I should also immediately point out, as you might imagine, I'm fairly boring, so I have absolutely no relevant financial relationship with commercial interests. Um, and the other thing I should point out is the major aspect of what I want to try to accomplish today um, is really context setting, um, both for those of you sort of using this series as an opportunity to learn a lot of genomics for the first time, but also as a framework to some extent for the speakers that will follow. In fact, usually I give the lead-off talk in the series for that exact reason, and my schedule just didn't allow me to go last week. But you will see as I go through um, why this is very much of a context setting talk. I'm going to first start off giving you some historical context for genomics as a backdrop, and then talk about some of the major achievements um, that have happened since the Human Genome Project ended 13 years ago, um, but really emphasize, paint the landscape of what the human genomics circumstance is uh, today and importantly uh, beyond. And as I said, really my goal for this as much as anything besides giving a sort of a foundation of information about genomics is to really help um, you see how the other speakers fit into this landscape that I'm about to paint. So in terms of a historical context, if we really go back um, even before uh, genomics uh, was uh, brought about as a discipline, um, it is really important to s uh, think about the series of major historical figures and their important contributions to help really fertilize the ground, if you will, of which genomics was able to grow out of. Um, I could probably spend the whole time talking about that. I'm just going to give what I think are the, some of the key highlights to think about. Obviously, Mendel deserves tremendous credit understanding and elucidating some of the basic laws of inheritance. Um, of course, I had no idea where those, that inheritance was actually coded for or where the information resided. Some of the clues started to come about with Meissner's work in the late 1800s when he actually discovered DNA as a, as a molecule. Um, but it really wasn't until Avery and colleagues' discoveries in the 1940s that demonstrated that DNA must be this inherited material, um, which therefore focused a lot of interest on DNA as an information molecule, uh, setting the stage brilliantly for what Watson and Crick uh, were able to accomplish in 1953. In fact, I would contend that the Watson-Crick discovery of the double helical structure of DNA in 1953 was arguably the most important single biomedical research discovery of the last century. I would certainly contend that the paper shown on the left was the most important publication uh, of the last century. Because what happened with the insights brought about by knowledge of the structure of DNA really set the stage for then really figuring out how DNA uh, was the information molecule of life and how it therefore encoded all the life processes, if you will. Um, that was, of course, um, in the 1950s. It's then in the 1960s, some of the key things we saw were, for example, the elucidation of the genetic code. For those who don't realize, much of that work was done right here on this campus. In fact, just outside of this auditorium is a small museum exhibit talking about some of Marshall Nuremberg's work in elucidating this uh, genetic code that we all now take for granted as the key translator table of going from DNA sequence uh, to protein sequence. Um, better and better tools started to come about um, in the 1970s, and particularly the 1980s, leading to DNA cloning, where for the first time we were able to actually um, isolate uh, and uh, clone and manipulate DNA in the laboratory, and even then being able to develop methods such as in uh, the late 1970s coming about uh, and much improved throughout the 1980s to actually read out the G's, A's, T's, and C's within DNA. 
So this progression uh, from Mendel all the way through uh, molecular biology and DNA cloning in many ways then set the stage for what transpired in the late 1980s. And what transpired were the, the, the coming together of all of these tools and technologies to allow us to start thinking about how to go and study in a more comprehensive way our, our genomes. Um, and that gave birth to this field called genomics. And you may not realize that that word didn't even exist until 1987, at least not in the scientific or, uh, literature. In fact, the first use of the word genomics in scientific print um, came about in this lead editorial of a brand new journal called Genomics, 1987, where they talked about a new discipline, a new name, a new journal. And in the lead editorial, they talked about this newly developing discipline of genome mapping and sequencing for which they adopted the term um, genomics and put this into the scientific uh, literature. Uh, 87 was particularly relevant for me because it was the year I graduated as an MD-PhD student, uh, reminding myself why I had never heard the word genomics once in medical school or graduate school because it simply didn't exist. So it really is important to emphasize we're only sort of 30 years in to this word of genomics as a discipline. So it is a remarkably young discipline. And I think its prominence on the biomedical research stage sometimes um, confuses us to think uh, uh, that, wow, it's been around forever. But it really hasn't. It actually is a very youthful discipline. Now, of course, the reason that discipline was named and the reason that there was a lot of attention in the late 1980s about genomics was because of this idea that was crafted in the late 1980s and launched in October of 1990, this notion of a human genome project, this large, audacious, international project that aimed among uh, a number of goals to read out the three billion Gs, As, Ts, and Cs that constitute the human genome. It's important to point out, by the way, uh, that we did have an odometer moment uh, recently. Uh, October 1 of last year, of 2015, marked the 25th anniversary, 25th anniversary of the launch of the Human Genome Project. Um, painful for me to think about because I, uh, I was a trainee. I feel like it was just yesterday, but it's been 25 years since I was there, literally at the starting line, participating in the Genome Project on day one um, and involved in it throughout its entire 13-year uh, span. Um, in fact, uh, uh, it was uh, remarkably successful, uh, finished ahead of time, not the original 15 years, finished in 13 years. And, uh, and it's now just sort of a key part of the rich history of biomedical research. Um, I actually had the opportunity um, to co-write a, a perspective piece that some of you might be interested in to commemorate the 25th anniversary launch of the Human Genome Project, and I did it with uh, the two individuals who have held the job I now hold. Um, uh, Jim Watson, the original director of the institute I now lead, and Francis Collins, previously was a director of the institute before I became um, an IH director, and the three of us wrote this perspective piece, not so much talking about the science of the Genome Project, but talking about sort of how uh, many legacy elements were left because of what the Human Genome Project did in terms of changing uh, big biology, if you will. Um, so I put you to that, put, point you to that article if you're interested in reading some of the historical aspects and, importantly, the legacy elements of the Genome Project beyond the base pairs. And, in fact, speaking about beyond the base pairs, we are celebrating this uh, odometer moment, this 25th anniversary, in another lecture series. So I'm going to put in a shameless plug uh, because, in fact, we have an ongoing lecture series that takes place right at this podium every month. And in fact, Thursday of this week, which I believe is tomorrow, yes, it is tomorrow, um, uh, you and Bernie will be speaking here at this podium tomorrow at 2 o'clock because we're bringing in a, a, a series of individuals who were there heavily involved in creating and executing the Human Genome Project, including people like you and um, who uh, really came into prominence at a very young age to, to help with the Genome Project's end stage and now really use that as a launching pad for his remarkable career. So if you're free at 2 o'clock tomorrow, please come here if you happen to miss it. Of course, we videotape this stuff and make it all available on our uh, Genome TV channel of, of YouTube. So it's been 25 years um, since the launch of the Genome Project and just a little over that uh, since the beginning of this field of genomics. So, to, to review things, I thought I would just talk about sort of what I think are the six key accomplishments or highlights, if you will, of genomics in its first quarter century or so of existence. And in reviewing these six areas, I want to also contextualize some of the signature efforts that you've probably heard about or if you haven't, you should be aware of, um, that really have been incredibly important for moving the field forward. A common theme 
of this will be these, some of these efforts, are many, most of these efforts are big and they're audacious and they're very much cast in the kind of style um, that the Human Genome Project was cast in because it was <coughs> remarkable what it accomplished. And in fact, highlight number one on this six highlights I'm going to give you is that the human genome was sequenced for the very first time by the Human Genome Project. And that absolutely is the, the number one highlight in many ways of the past 25 years. And it, it's a highlight both because it provided such incredible information about our blueprint, which has launched so many other efforts that I'm going to talk about, but it's also important because it launched a whole lot of other areas, um, use of genomics as a pivotal tool for advancing those fields. And in fact, this is a subset of those areas, but every one of these areas have been remarkably um, advanced and enriched because genomics has found their way to be impactful in, um, in, in, in these areas. Um, and every one of these could be a talk in and of themselves and probably an entire symposium. I'm not going to talk about any of this because as I, uh, although Julie Segre will um, talk about, um, and she'll be one of the speakers in this series on May 18th and will in fact point out an example of how genomics is really in many ways completely changing the face of diagnostics when it comes to infectious agents. My emphasis will be more on human health and human disease and, and medicine um, because that's the one that in particular is of greatest relevance for us here at NIH, in particular for, for my institute, the National Human Genome Research Institute. And as Andy mentioned in the introduction, um, uh, I've been at the Institute for about 21 years. I've been in the field uh, since the beginning. Um, but six years ago, I became the director. And while I certainly was involved in thinking about these things um, when I was uh, in my previous roles at the Institute, certainly when I became director, I became increasingly laser focused on thinking about how to facilitate the application of genomics to, to health, disease, and medicine, um, framing it around the concept of genomic medicine. Um, as sort of the ultimate goal, if you will. And by, by genomic medicine, I mean this as a medical discipline um, that involves using genomic information about an individual as part of their clinical care. And of course, important other implications of that clinical use. Um, this, of course, is largely synonymous with other terms you'll hear, individualized medicine, personalized medicine, and later on we're going to talk about precision medicine. I would say our framing of this is, is really very much limited to genomic information as a subpart of some of these other ways to frame it. But we're really going to stay focused on the genomic information as a means of individualizing care. So in thinking about what we want to do as a field, certainly what my institute wants to do um, as a research uh, funder, um, we really think about this as a progression um, where we need to traverse a series of accomplishments to eventually see genomic medicine become a reality. Um, we are grounded heavily in the starting line of the Human Genome Project. That's what we really think started all this, um, which in some ways means the starting line was 13 years ago uh, because we think once we had a sequence of the human genome, that really then set up a circumstance for accomplishments that I'm about to tell you about. And eventually, we're going to realize genomic medicine and um, we're going to see uh, the practice of medicine change because of the use of genomic information. But this is not going to happen overnight and it's not a sort of a simple one kind of project effort. It involves many steps, it's going to involve many countries, it's going to involve thousands of scientists, um, it's going to require an amazing amount of creativity and we can't even anticipate all the things we're going to need, although we can anticipate some of them and I think we've done a lot in the last 13 years. I also want to emphasize um, this is going to require a community, a highly interdisciplinary community of, of, of scientists, healthcare professionals and, and people in all, all people that are touching healthcare in some form and science and research. Um, and they're going to all have to be very, very um, highly collegial um, and we're going to have to be doing this together for a long time. The analogy I've been using is one of a marathon. I mean, really, you're going to have a lot of people running shoulder to shoulder. It is not a sprint and we have to be in this for the long haul because there's a lot of complexities, some of which I'll be unpacking throughout my talk. But that's a tall order. I mean, you know, sort of thinking about how do you go from sort of the base pairs provided by the Genome Project to actually change how we take care of patients at the bedside or maybe if you prefer the metaphor from double helix to human health, you know, that's going to require some pretty clear and important strategic thinking around this. Um, and there's one thing the genomics community I think is really good at is we're really good at being strategic. Um, and uh, we're also very good at sort of organizing how we want to pursue things. It was sort of in the fabric of what we did during the Genome Project. In fact, the way we accomplished the Genome Project um, was to every couple of years develop a new strategic plan that would guide the next few years 
um, and be willing to, by the way, rip up a strategic plan when it seemed outdated after a few years and come up with a new one. So since that was sort of, sort of culturally what we did to sort of map out the next set of things that needed to be accomplished, it probably wasn't surprising that literally the day the Genome Project ended, 13, nearly 13 years ago, um, our institute uh, published um, following an incredible amount of consultation with the community, a strategic plan for the future of genomics immediately starting <coughs> after the Genome Project was completed. And, and it, it served us well, I will tell you, for a number of years. But, it, but like many things, uh, when, when there's scientific advances, it doesn't serve you well forever because new opportunities come up. And in fact, we saw those new opportunities uh, by around uh, the end of uh, 2009, 2010 in particular. Um, and we recognized it was time for a new strategic vision, or an updated strategic vision, in which we put out, uh, once again, uh, co-authored by members of the Institute, again involving a lot of strategic consultation with the community. The big difference for the first time with our 2011 strategic plan, which is the one we still use, was the incorporation of genomic medicine as a key element, as a key goal, as I've articulated to you, in fact, putting it in the title of that strategic plan. So for uh, those of you who have not read this, it is, you know, five years old, and um, we've really looked critically at it very recently and actually still feel it has a very, very, very good uh, shelf life in terms of just still being very fresh and robust. I guess I'm not allowed to give out required reading for this class, but I will tell you that a lot of the things that we say in the strategic plan will be on the test. So for those of you who really want to know what's on the test at the end of this, about three people just left because they thought there really is a test. They just dropped the class. No, I can't make mandatory reading, but I would strongly encourage you, if you're here to learn about genomics, um, this would be a great article to read. Even though it's 2011, it's still quite um, relevant to everything I'm talking about and many things I don't have time to talk about. If you want to quickly download it, you can get to a PDF immediately by going to that URL. But don't read it while I'm talking, because I have a lot of things I want to cover. You can read it afterwards. But let me just give you a general overview of what the strategic plan um, describes as a, as a framework. Because, in fact, the framework that we put forth in this serves as an organizing principles in many ways for almost everything we're doing at our institute, and I think in many ways is a nice framing of many of the things going on here um, in the entire field of, of genomics. Because what we heard during our strategic planning that led up to the 2011 publication was that it was finally time for the genomics community to be more specific and more sophisticated in describing how they were going to actually go from basic genomic information to actually changing the practice of medicine. It was always a thing we would say during the Genome Project, one day this, this would be really important for how we practice medicine. But now, 2011, it was time to actually start to describe a research agenda that would inch you closer and closer to actually changing the practice of medicine. It was important to organize the thinking and programmatically important to, to, to know how you were going to develop research programs that helped with this progression from left to right. So at the end of the day, we found that we could describe everything we needed to do or most things we needed to do is in five major bins of activities or domains as we called them. Let me introduce you to those domains. I mean, one of the first one was something we were very familiar with, understanding the structure of genomes, largely what we had done during the Genome Project and the immediate period beyond, um, but also recognizing that we also needed to understand the biology of genomes, how those Gs, As, Ts, and Cs did all of their work. Um, and that was an important thing ongoing, but was a domain of research activities. And with knowledge then about how the genome works, it <coughs> provides you opportunities to use genomics to then understand the biology of disease. How is it that changes in our genomes influence our health and well-being? And having a, 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 a clear domain focused around uh, human disease was very important. Obviously, if you start to get insights about human disease, it provides you the opportunity to think about how to advance medical science. And that would involve clinical research that would eventually give you uh, ability to think about how to use genomics to maybe have a more sophisticated approach to medicine. Um, but, but just because you have better ways of practicing medicine doesn't necessarily mean you've proven that you're going to change how well healthcare works. So we also sort of put down as an, a domain of responsibility in many ways for doing research to eventually demonstrate that you can actually improve the effectiveness of how you're caring for your patients <coughs> using uh, genomic approaches. So these five domains really do represent what we think about, and I think as I will now continue um, to describe my highlights of the last quarter century, you will see how we are moving from left to right on that progression through these series of domains, eventually finding ourselves thinking about medical science and hopefully eventually improving the effectiveness of healthcare. So with that as a backdrop, 
Let me continue with my highlights of the last quarter century um, of genomics. Well, we sequenced the human genome for the first time in the Human Genome Project. But while that was incredibly satisfying, we were thinking about one day sequencing patients' genomes. And to do that, uh, we needed to make sure that we could cost effectively and highly accurately sequence people's genomes, not just once, but many, many, many times. Well, to accomplish that, we needed to very much reduce the cost of sequencing. The good news is we've done it. Um, in fact, the cost for sequencing a human genome has redu been reduced nearly a million fold of, uh, since uh, the Human Genome Project's first sequencing of the human genome. Now, that didn't happen by accident. Um, and in fact, uh, our institute deserves, I think, um, some credit, uh, although not exclusive credit, but some credit of recognizing that this was pivotally important for that what needed to happen once the Genome Project was completed. And in fact, in the strategic plan that we wrote um, and published the day the Genome Project ended, uh, we said a lot of things in that strategic plan, but one of the things of relevance here is we talked about technological leaps that seem so far off as to be almost fictional, but which, if they could be achieved, would revolutionize biomedical research and clinical practice. And we gave as an example, we gave several examples, but the key example relevant here was an example was the ability to sequence DNA at costs that are lowered by four to five orders of magnitude than the current cost, allowing a human genome to be sequenced for $1,000 or less. So here it was, the Genome Project ended, and um, we put our names on a nature paper that said we need to now go out and figure out how to sequence a human genome for $1,000. It was a rather audacious claim, considering that day marked the, the final day where we had finished sequencing the first human genome. But when we added up all the costs associated with sequencing that first human genome, it came in at something like a billion dollars. And people will argue about whether it was 600 million or 700 million, 800. I just rounded up roughly a billion dollars. And here we were on that day proposing, oh, we just need to knock six zeros off of that figure and eventually come up with a $1,000 genome. And while it was audacious, it was catalytic. Now, meanwhile, it was catalytic because we decided as an institute to put out a major granting program. Um, and that major granting program um, aimed to collect great ideas from creative scientists um, around the world, actually. And their, go goal, their goal was basically to get rid of this, because this was the factories that were used for sequencing that first human genome. This was one of multiple factories that were used for sequencing that first genome. And we wanted creative people to come up with some fancy schmancy way uh, to sequence DNA, shown here in iconic form, is something magical and revolutionary that would knock six zeros off of that figure. And the good news is not only did we get creative scientists to come in and we gave grants to and they did remarkable high-risk things, many of which paid off, the good news was that the private sector met us as partners. And the private sector recognized this is what was important too. And there was a considerable amount of private sector investment as well, um, in many cases commercializing things that came out of some of our scientists, our funded scientists' effort. And the rest is history. I mean, it's 13 years, but the rest is history. This has been chronicled in Nature articles talking about our, this program and these efforts. And the graph on the left is sort of an iconic graph that we put out, and we have a whole web page that catalogs and has been cataloging the cost of sequencing, by, uh, especially by the, the centers that we support for big, uh, large-scale sequencing. And in green is the cost of sequencing on logarithmic scale, cost of sequencing a human genome. It's just fallen precipitously. And it's because of fancy, wonderful new technologies, uh, such as those, those shown on the right, and it's, it's not just the fact that we are getting really close to a $1,000 genome, because that's one thing we are, and that's where it's almost a million-fold reduction. Um, it's that it's also how quickly we can sequence genomes. So to give you a perspective, you know, that first human genome sequence as part of the Genome Project cost something like a billion dollars, but it also took six to eight years of active sequencing. Um, that's a long time uh, to get a sequence. But today, using new methods, um, only a few thousand dollars, we're getting close to a thousand. Um, but you can also do this in about a day or two. Um, and in fact, there's many uh, belief using new protocols, we will get this down to a day or less than a day um, in the coming year. And the other thing that's really exciting about this and these technologies is that whatever you think we use today, it probably won't be what we're using two or three years from now. It is very much like sitting at an airport where you know you have a lot of nice planes on the ground, but you look over the horizon and there's more planes coming. And then there's another one, and then there's another one. I happen to know there's some really cool technologies that are sort of early stage, aren't ready to be commercialized, but, you know, they're about the second or third plane in. 
and probably within about a year or two, they will be supplanting, I think, uh, some other the technologies that we currently use today. So it's very, very exciting time, and it's not letting up. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of excitement over nanopores, that's the latest rage, and devices such as that shown um, here on the bottom right that literally plug into the USB port of your laptop and can sequence DNA and maybe be able to sequence a human genome within a day if all things work out. Remarkably exciting developments. Um, and uh, we just sort of stand back and, and watch this happen. Um, and so there's a lot to be described in uh, these new technologies. And in fact, one of the most popular lectures in this series of late um, has been Elaine Martis, who's kind enough to fly here and give a lecture, a real leader um, in, in sequencing technology. And she'll be here May 25th. And uh, it's not a lecture you want to miss, because it, I think it always gets the highest YouTube hits, if I'm correct. Um, and she will, she will describe what I just gave in three slides, and she'll talk about it for over an hour. And there's a lot to talk about um, uh, in, in DNA sequencing technologies. I do want to point out, because some of this talk is a little philosophical, um, how important these technological advances have been for the field of genomics. You know, and in the history of science, you've often seen major inflections in scientific progress because of technological advances. I'll give you a few. You know, Lisa said the telescope sort of changed the face of astronomy. The microscope changed the face of cell biology. And certainly devices such as that shown on the left, um, various radiographic uh, methods, um, really changed the face of radiology as we know it. And, and trust me, that's exactly what is happening with these new instruments. Technologies for sequencing DNA in the last 13 years have completely changed the face of genomics. In fact, I think it's changing the face of biomedical research as genomics sort of permeates across um, the entire enterprise of biomedicine. So that's a great accomplishment. Elaine will tell you more. Well, that's great. Now we can sequence genomes quite inexpensively. Um, and that we particularly want to do because we want to sequence many people's genomes. Um, and now we can afford to do it. Um, and, it's, and the reason we want to do it is we're not just interested in that first reference sequence. That just sort of gave us a hypothetical individual. It wasn't even one person. It was a patchwork of people. It was a reference. We, in fact, want to sequence hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands of people because we want to figure out how all of us are different. Um, the good news is that even so far, we've already sequenced now tens of thousands, and I'll probably have to change this slide fairly soon that we'll have to say hundreds of thousands of human genomes actually have been sequenced in one form or the other worldwide. And that is providing us a very remarkable opportunity to understand how we all have different blueprints. So let me just remind you, um, any one, any two of us differ about every one out of a thousand bases as you go across uh, all the letters um, in your genome. Um, those differences are variants, at least depicted here as single nucleotide variants, a G where other people might have a C or an A where somebody else might have a T, and so forth. And so we have millions of those variants compared to any reference or compared to the person sitting next to you. But the great majority of those variants are inconsequential from a biological or medical perspective, but a subset are very, very consequential. And we want to know those. And by the way, it's not that you all have your own private set of millions of variants. And nobody, most of the variants you have are very common. Um, and other people have, probably other people in this room have. Um, and uh, that makes it a situation where we could imagine if they're very relatively common, if we just sequenced enough people, we could develop catalogs of those variants. And then if we had catalogs of those variants and we had really good methods, we could probably start figuring out which ones are consequential and which ones are not. And, which ones might be not so good variants, might confer a risk for a disease, and which ones might be good variants because they maybe protect you from a disease and they may be associated with some other positive attribute. And so as a result, having sequenced that first human genome, there was remarkable motivation to start cataloging common variants in the human population. You might have heard about um, um, the desire to get single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, and indeed, or SNPs, and the first effort was something called the SNP Consortium, but that quickly, once it started to get some traction, gave rise to something called the International HapMap Project, which attempted to not only catalog these SNPs, these single nucleotide variants, but also to help us figure out how they relate to one another on blocks of DNA called haplotypes on human chromosomes, because it turns out that not all these variants just sort of go all different directions as they're inherited, but rather they're neighborhoods of variants that have many variants in a big <coughs> block of DNA on a chromosome, tend to stick together as they get inherited from one generation to the next. And th so through a series of publications, uh, the last one being in 2010, um, a lot of information about, um, about SNPs, single nucleotide variants, and their haplotype structure, 
um, was elucidated and shared with the biomedical research community. But right around 2010, or even a couple years before, the new methods for sequencing DNA came about that allowed us to really accelerate the pace of discovering variants in the human population. And that gave rise to the signature project, the Thousand Genomes Project, which was another audacious, large international effort like the HapMap Project and like the Human Genome Project to catalog the most common variants across the world, actually. And you can see from a collection of, of uh, by the way, a lot of times in genomics, we overachieve. And so we originally named the project 1,000 Genomes and quickly overachieved. So over 2,500 <coughs> genomes were sequenced in the end, collected from 26 populations in the world, initially described um, as in this marker paper, as they're called, um, in 2010, um, and, uh, and then finally cultivating um, in this remarkable paper coming out uh, last uh, October. Uh, the, sort of the final paper, final major paper of the Thousand Genomes Project. And what, what's remarkable about their effort is that we're once upon a time when the Genome Project ended and we had information about maybe thousands, tens of thousands maybe, of variants that we knew existed in the human population at specific points in the genome. Um, thousand Genomes had sort of gotten us up to a much higher threshold. In fact, they got us to the point where there are about 90 million places in the human genome we now know are variant across the human population, and we know the variants that sit at those particular sites. So we went from tens of thousands to nearly 90 million uh, variants uh, of sites that we know exist, and that gave rich, rich, rich catalogs of information that could then be used for scientists to test which of those variants are important. And so Lynn Jordy, I, I will once again take the last three slides I gave and, and unpack it in much greater detail when he is here on April 20th talking about population uh, genomics and some of these efforts that I just quickly described to you. Now the other interesting thing about the ability to sequence tens of thousands of human genomes is it begins to give us insight about what any one of our genomes look like. Because one of the things we're always curious about is when we eventually get to this point of using genomics to take care of patients, we're going to want to know what is a typical patient's genome, what's it like, and, and what can we learn from it. So we're starting to learn this and a lot more, but I just thought it's fun numbers to put in the back of your head. What does your genome look like by the number? And if you ever get your genome sequenced, you'll want to know some of these numbers. I mean, for example, um, you have six billion nucleotides, roughly, in your genome, right? Because there's three billion as the reference sequence, three billion nucleotides, but you have two genomes, right? You got one for mom, one for dad. So when we sequence a person's genome, we're actually sequencing six billion nucleotides or getting information on six billion nucleotides. But a typical person, on average, when you sequence their six billion nucleotides, they have about three to five million single nucleotide variants. And if you do the arithmetic, that's about what we expected. Um, so compared to the city, person sitting next to you, there's about three to five million differences between your two genome sequences. And as I told you earlier, most of the variants you have in fact, the great, 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 great majority of them are common. We already know about them. They're in the databases. You can open up a browser and go to a data resource and you will find that variant. But, but that's not all of them because about 150,000 of those variants, a minority of your three to five million, are not in databases yet. So every single time when we still sequence a new human genome, we come up with new variants. They're just, those are the very rare variants, but they're still worth having and we keep collecting them. And actually, what's very interesting is that when we sequence a given person's genome, on average, we'll find about 60 such variants that did not exist in either parent. And of course, this is how new variants get created. And in the process of creating the two germ cells that gave rise to you, all that DNA had to be replicated. And while there's a lot of DNA repair going on, there are some oopses that happen. And each of you is associated with about 60 oopses. Um, most of those, I'm sure the great majority, are completely inconsequential, but occasionally, this is how you end up with a, a genetic disorder in a child that where it didn't come, wasn't inherited from either parent because it came about brand new, and that would be an example of that. But again, the majority of these differences are completely uh, inconsequential to your health and well-being. So that's just a little aside um, and a lot more being learned about how many of your repertoire of genes, how many times your genes mutated and broke and so forth, and we're learning a lot about that for the average patient. Well, having had sequenced the first human genome, developing ways to sequence <coughs> genomes cheaper and cheaper, and then going out and actually sequencing many, many genomes and getting lots of knowledge about variation in the genome, um, it immediately started to, and already was happening in parallel, wanting to know, okay, well, when you have a sequence difference, what does it do? How does it influence uh, the, the viability or any as the development, any aspect of, of, a, of a creature, in, in this case, of a human? So to do that, we really need to understand how it is that the human genome actually functions. 
And I would tell you, 13 years having, following the end of the Genome Project, there have been profound advances in understanding how the human genome actually functions. Um, and, and let me just remind you um, that, that that was not what the Genome Project was supposed to do. This, this is what the Genome Project was supposed to do, and they did it. Um, they uh, basically read out all these letters. Of course, this is only a subset of what the Genome Project did. This is only 0.001% of what the Genome Project did. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a complicated language that is very hard to sort of immediately grasp where is the important parts. And uh, I will tell you that when the Genome Project ended 13 years ago, our tools for actually interpreting the three billion letters was, were really, really weren't that great. They were quite nascent. Um, they were not bad for genes, um, but for understanding non Gene, the, non, the functional parts of the genome that are not genes were actually quite weak, and we had a lot of work to do. But we did know a thing or two about genes, um, um, and in fact, uh, we knew that genes had introns and exons, and we knew that, that that DNA got made in RNA, and that that RNA could be alternately spliced, and you can get different gene products as a result of that. And we were armed with that genetic code I told you about earlier, so at least when it came to the, the protein coding genes, we could look up and figure out how they made protein. So we were pretty good shape for genes. Um, and so we went to it, and uh, when I say we, I mean the community went to it and went through and quickly highlighted all the parts of the human genome that looked like they were genes, acted like genes, and therefore probably were genes for the most part. And at the end of the day, that only accounted for about one and a half percent of the letters of the human genome. And by, although while we still work on the exact number, it's about 20,000 genes, much lower than we anticipated, but that's the number. But what was interesting was that we knew there was a lot more functional stuff in there and that we were surprised by how little of the human genome actually coded for genes, only one and a half percent. And we knew there was an amazing amount of other choreography that had to be at play to figure out where, when, and how much genes were going to get turned on and helping chromosomes function, all sorts of things. And we knew we had to find that stuff, um, all that functional stuff outside of genes. Um, and it was interesting because at the end of the day, uh, you know, we, we would have thought we'd have really brilliant people on the planet brilliant scientists to help us, but at the end of the day, we actually looked back in time to help be guided how we were going to figure out all the functional sequence of the human genome. And probably one of the most inspirational figures that influenced us were not any of the people listed here, but actually someone was listed even before here, and that was Darwin. And it was sort of interesting how Darwin really came to be commonly discussed um, immediately when the Genome Project ended. Uh, because there were so many things that Darwin taught us um, in his writings. Um, you know, he, one of his famous things that was at least attributed to him is, you know, not the strongest of species that survives nor the most intelligent, but it's the one that's most adaptable to change. And he hinted at the idea that something was going on uh, through evolution, that something was being changed to have uh, sort of species survive and adapt and eventually, um, you know, sort of deal with sort of the evolutionary progression. Um, of course, we now know that stuff is the DNA. That's what's, what, where, where it's all at. And that's why a more contemporary scientist, genomicist, uh, wrote uh, right around the time the Genome Project ended that for the last three and a half billion years, evolution has been taking notes. And those notes are in the sequences of the genomes of all these creatures. And so I, I mentioned Darwin, I mentioned that quote because what happened when the Genome Project ended was a recognition that we needed to do lots of comparisons of our genome sequence with other creatures to better understand how our genome sequence works. And we also recognized that we were just, as, as a species, just one really teeny little twig on a tree of life of great richness and that buried in those notebooks in the DNA sequence of these other creatures was lots of important information. So that's the reason, and many of you probably recognize, that's the reason why we went off and started sequencing lots of critters and their genomes. And first we started with laboratory models, mice and rats and companion animals like dogs and our closest relatives like chimps. But in fact, we needed to use the power of comparative sequence analysis and sampling more broadly across the tree why we started sequencing lots of other critters, selectively and strategically picked off of different trees. A subsweat is here. Originally, it was like 25 species, and it went to 100 species. Now, we're well over 200 species have been sequenced. And we used all that rich data to basically start asking questions like, what sequences in the human genome are conserved across all mammals? or across all vertebrates, or across all primates. Because if they're conserved that heavily, they don't change over that many years of evolution, they must be important, because evolution just has a way of going in there and wanting to sort of change things if it's not important. 
And so that was the rationale for moving beyond the human sequence and now sequencing many, many, many species. Um, and in fact, what that gave us was remarkable insights about where in the human genome are the most conserved sequences through evolution, pointing to the sequences most likely to be functionally important. And in doing that, you end up with about 5 to 10 percent of the human genome sequence, 5 to 10 percent of the 3 billion letters, are conserved across almost all mammals. And they're almost certainly functionally important. But that's 5 to 10 percent of which the genes, protein coding genes, 1 and 1 half percent, is a minority. So right, 5 to 10 percent must be functionally important at a minimum, and only 1 and 1 half percent of that is protein coding genes, which means the purple stuff is non-coding functional sequences in many cases conserved as aggressively throughout evolution as have been our protein coding genes. Now, what are these non-coding functional sequences doing? Well, they're doing a lot. Probably the thing we know the most about is that they're incredibly important in this complex choreography of, um, of gene regulation. All these elements, enhancers and promoters and silencers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all these sequence elements that are controlling these crazy things that are going on and where, when, and how much genes are turned on. And so that's some of that. But we also know that it's not just all gene regulation. I mean, there's important sequences that help package up chromosomes, important sequences that help segregate chromosomes, important sequences that help replicate chromosomes. Um, and in fact, we know for certain that there's all sorts of complexity in RNA. Um, and uh, we have really started to reveal a remarkable amount of function associated with non-coding RNAs, something we didn't even know about when the Genome Project began. And now that's very, very instrumentally important in many biological functions, including gene regulation. And finally, I would contend we should just recognize um, that there are things we just don't know about um, in non-coding parts of the genome that are certainly uh, functionally important. Uh, we just haven't found them and figured them out yet, and just nobody's written about them in textbooks. Uh, but they're coming, and we're going to figure this out. Um, and in fact, that's a very high priority area. Um, Oh, and the other thing that's transpired in the last uh, 13 years was a greater and greater and greater appreciation for yet another way that DNA functions, not by directly having the primary sequence confer function, but by having marks on our DNA put down that influence how DNA functions. These are called epigenomic marks, and leading to the whole world of epigenomics. Um, and uh, this involves chromatin and, also, and, and, and methylation and various modifications to DNA. And it just turns out that the same methods that you can use for sequencing DNA can be adapted to read out the epigenomic marks in DNA. So now we have this incredibly strong ability to read out the second genomic code, if you will. Um, and in fact, I'm going to turn this whole topic over to Laura Elnitsky, who's going to, on March 16th, come and tell you much more about epigenomics and also about gene regulation, the topic I was just talking about. And so a lot has happened um, in this arena, but boy, we also know a lot more needs to happen. It actually keeps getting more complicated because I would say in the last five years, we've also realized that DNA is not just some innocent little linear molecule that lays out of the nucleus, but rather DNA also takes on in the form of chromosomes three-dimensional structures and that these three-dimensional structures also have some functional um, activities going on with different domains interacting. And so the whole world of genomes in three dimensions is unfolding, again, because of technological advances that we can figure out what those interactions are. And that's also a very exciting um, area of active research. So how do we do this? I mean, how do we figure this out? What have we been doing to elucidate genome function? Well, it's not simple. Um, it will involve, I will tell you, multiple generations of scientists to help us fully elucidate the function of the human genome. And it also involves a number of different um, elements, if you will. I mean, I will tell you to start off with that we recognize that like other efforts in genomics, Human Genome Project, Thousand Genomes, and so forth, this was the, we needed a team of people working on this to figure it out. I mean, that is why almost immediately after the Genome Project ended, we launched a program called the ENCODE Project. ENCODE stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, aiming to catalog all the functional elements in the human genome, like those uh, color highlights I showed earlier. Um, it's actually, and it's, uh, it's been going uh, quite effectively. We're about to start the next phase of ENCODE over the next year or so. It also had a sibling for a while call, called Mod ENCODE for Model Organism ENCODE. And what these efforts, ENCODE, Mod ENCODE, basically do is create GPS-like views of the genome. So here you're looking at one such view, 
this is just a view of the human genome that you can get to public on a publicly accessible website where you zoom in and out and look at it. And this is just an overwhelming amount of data generated by ENCODE. Some of it's laboratory-based data, some of it's experimental data. But I'm not going to go through it, but needless to say, it has everything we could possibly imagine at the moment having information about that region of the genome with respect to where are the genes, where are the conserved sequences, where's uh, transcription factors binding, what parts of DNA gets made into RNA, where's the chromatin opening up, and so forth. And that data really provides some insights about where's the functional stuff. And the challenge, of course, is synthesizing all of this and really getting a very strict interpretation for every nucleotide what the function is. But this is the kind of thing ENCODE has been doing in other efforts. Uh, there's a big epigenomics effort that went on, similarly, has contributed to this as well and will continue to do so. Um, this has involved not just looking at human DNA, but recognizing that model organisms play a very important role in this, a very basic science effort to understand genome function that sort of traverses everything from, from, from yeast all the way to humans. I'll tell you that increasingly computational modeling comes in. This is not just about doing experiments and, and more and more sophisticated computational mod modeling methods are needed to fully elucidate how the human genome works. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, there have been major and will continue to need to be major advances in technology development to really figure out all the nuances of the human genome. And I will tell you that I, I, John Quackenbush will be here April 27th talking about many aspects of, of gene expression and systems biology, and I'm sure he will touch some of the things that I'm representing in this part, in particular in this slide, and so I thought I would point that out. So where are we in interpreting the human genome? Well, I guess I could say a couple things. I sometimes say that it's multi-generational. We're just in the first generation. Our, my grandchildren, I would imagine, will be interpreting, helping to interpret the human genome sequence. You know, I sometimes say that you know, when the Genome Project ended, we knew about this much, about how the human genome works. Now we know about this much, and eventually we need to know about this much, so we still have a long way to go. We've made a lot of progress. Sometimes I just sort of joke and say we're sort of at a SparkNotes view of the human genome, for those of you who know what SparkNotes is. You know, maybe it'll get you ready for the test tomorrow, but you know, it's really a hard problem. Uh, we're going to need more than just SparkNotes, and, but that's why we will need to keep hammering at this. This is, this is going to be a long haul part of the marathon, figuring out how the human genome works. Well, here we are. We have the sequence. We have our blueprint. We can easily and cheaply get at other sequences. We're beginning to understand how our sequences differ among people, and we are starting to get better and better insights about the function of the genome. It is time to start thinking about what we originally thought was going to be really valuable for genomics, and that is to be able to start applying our efforts to understand human disease. And I would contend there have been significant advances, especially in the last 13 years, in unraveling the genomic basis of human disease. And this certainly deserves uh, the fifth part of the highlight. Now, I will also point out, um, and I'm going to programmatically just sort of mention, that I think our institute has been very helpful at, at figuring out how to use genome sequencing to study human disease. Um, and that really grew out of our commitment to having our, especially our extramural research efforts, um, be staying us, keeping us at the cutting edge of genome analysis. So our largest part of our institute's extramural portfolio is our a thing called our genome sequencing program, which has had a progression uh, starting with the Genome Project. They were the groups that, in the United States, in particular the NIH-funded parts, that were heavily involved in generating the first sequence of the human genome, and then moving on to help us figure out the sequence of these other genomes I alluded to, and then working on things like the HapMap project and the thousand genomes that I've mentioned. And, and then starting to focus on disease and initially uh, working on uh, d cancer, which I'm going to have more to say about in a bit, but the, a very well-known project called the Cancer Genome Atlas, which we did in partnership with the Cancer Institute, um, which is now um, in its, its last phase. But then in particular of late and now moving forward, focusing on rare and common diseases, simply asking the question, how can you scale up the use of genome sequencing? to be able to figure out the genomic basis of rare and common diseases. And so let me just remind you, because uh, this is really important to understand the differences between rare and common diseases when it comes to the underlying genomic architecture. Well, so on the one hand, we have rare diseases. Uh, these are diseases like sickle cell and cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, rare in the population, but, but it turns out uh, they're quite simple, quite, sorry, it's an understatement, but um, in terms of simply involving uh, mutations affecting a single gene. These are monogenic disorders, also referred to as Mendelian disorders, after the famous uh, geneticist Mendel. And, and, and here, 
it is very clear there's great potential. There's over 7,000 known rare diseases. Um, and um, remarkably, uh, we recognize that, that with the new sequencing methods, we can really accelerate the pace at which we can figure out uh, the genomic basis of rare diseases. We've had a number for several years, and we've just renewed the program of a program called the Centers for Mendelian Genomics, which is a series of centers that truly is doing that tackling uh, these rare disorders in an industrialized fashion to try to figure out uh, the underlying uh, mutations in these genes. Um, and they've made great progress um, along with the other worldwide efforts, but you have to recognize there's more progress to be made, which is why we have these centers working so hard. There are about 7,500 rare genetic diseases, but and we have found the gene or the defective, uh, the mutated um, the mutations underlying those diseases for about 4,300 of those. 4,300 is a remarkable number considering that the day the Genome Project started, we only knew the genomic basis for 61 of those diseases. So in a quarter century, we've gone from knowledge about 61 diseases to knowledge, molecular knowledge, about 4,300. That's the good news. The challenging news is we want to finish this up. We want to get the next few thousand, and that's what this program is doing. And so that's been a remarkable advance, I think, in the last quarter century with respect to rare diseases. Now, what about the other class of diseases, common diseases, because common diseases are what you're much more familiar with. You know, rare diseases are rare in the population. They're, they're, they're certainly of, 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 um, quite burdensome to families and patients, but in aggregate, that's not what accounts for most hospital visits, clinics visits. That's not what fill hospitals and clinics. It's, it's common diseases that fill hospitals and clinics. This is hypertension, diabetes, autism, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, and so forth. And they're common in the population. The hard part is that they're complicated. They're complicated because it's not just a single gene. In fact, it's not even necessarily genes. It could even be, we actually believe a lot of it is non-coding uh, functional sequences. It's multiple, multiple variants, we believe, um, in, uh, scattered throughout the genome with what is typically a greater contribution of the environment, especially compared to rare diseases. And so we knew this was going to be really complicated, and indeed it certainly has proven to be pretty complicated. This, of course, was why there was a big push um, once we, that's the reason why we wanted to get all these variants cataloged so that we could do studies to analyze these variants in thousands of people. And we could do this across the whole genome, genome-wide, and we could try to associate known common variants with diseases like hypertension, diabetes, and so forth. That's what gave rise to the genome-wide association study idea, GWAS. And GWAS was an idea that on paper everybody hoped would work. And it did. And starting in 2008 was the first published uh, genome-wide association study. Um, and since 2008, there's been over 2,000 such studies um, that have come about. And in fact, there are now about 4,000 places in the genome that we believe have a variant in them um, that are conferring risk for getting the disease. The problem is it's, it's, it's just a risk. It's not an absolute. Usually these are absolutes. These are not. Um, and it's not telling you which variant it is. These GWAS studies only tell you what neighborhood they live in. They only tell you a region of a chromosome. There's still lots and lots of variants there. And so the good news is that we've, we've gone from sort of not knowing how to decipher this complexity to having some really good ideas of where we really need to hunt in greater detail. Um, but there's been only a very few examples where we've actually gotten it down to a very specific variant and known what that variant is doing. And we need to do that thousands and thousands of times for all these very important disorders. Um, so we need to actually, what we've learned in the last five years in particular is we need bigger and bigger efforts. That's why we actually have now turned the attention of our largest centers in a new program, which actually we just formally announced a few weeks ago, called the Centers for Common Disease Genomics. And these are centers that are going to teach us how to do this, we hope, along with other efforts in the world, um, where there are, we now know that you don't just, we, we need to completely sequence the genomes of lots of people with a disease like hypertension or cardiovascular disease or autism and Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, and then lots of controls. And you need to probably do tens of thousands, we now are recognizing, and have very large data sets to analyze and then use very fancy statistical methods to tease out which of the variants that are actually the ones conferring risk. And so while we don't have as much to report yet with common diseases like we do with rare diseases, I would just say we are on a trajectory. I think that's going to give us a lot of insights about strategically how we're going to do this, and hopefully we will get uh, a lot of new insights over the next five and ten years. But I will tell you that all of these efforts, especially what's going on now um, in efforts like this, where literally tens of thousands of individuals' genomes are going to be sequenced and analyzed, 
uh, are gonna, is just an immense amount of data. And that's on top of all the other data of all the other projects I've been telling you about. And, and um, oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention before I go on, Dave, um, is with everything else, a lot more will be said about rare diseases when Dave Valley is here on April 13th, and a lot more will be said about common diseases in a much more sophisticated way than I did by Karen Mulkey when she's here on April 6th. But what all of them will tell you is that, and in fact, all of you probably realize, is that the world we now live in as these wonderful technologies get us more and more data is that we have the circumstance where we are overwhelmed by the amount of data coming out of these sequencing instruments and um, in particular and other, other new technologies. And this is sort of putting us, in fact, into a new circumstance where the bottleneck is not generating the information, the bottleneck is analyzing it. And so this bottleneck um, really is one where uh, these fancy new methods for sequencing DNA are giving us a circumstance where reading out a genome sequence is not the hard part. You know, the hard part actually is, um, um, is sort of progressing on um, and then figuring out what to do with the information about the variants in our genomes. Um, as you're going to hear from other speakers, you know, there's issues just around uh, hardware and having enough capacity to store all this data. There's issues of very, we need increasingly better and better software tools. And of course, we need a workforce that's able to do all of this. Um, which is why some of you are here, is to help become that, that workforce. Um, and uh, that also has to include taking it to the final stage of knowing how to take information about individual variants and knowing how relevant that is for individual patients. So as th this is why Tara and Andy in particular dedicate three lectures, talk about the data analysis, the data science, the bioinformatics, whatever phrase you want to use of everything I'm describing, because data analysis is actually sort of the big part of all, of all of this, and in many ways, is sort of the grand challenge that all of us are working on. So I've gone through five highlights of the past quarter century. Um, and then, of course, we, as a recognition, I've said nothing about medical practice, as if maybe there wasn't any highlights. And probably a few years ago, um, I would have been very limited in what I might have been able to say. But I actually think that this is worth putting as a sixth highlight of, of the first quarter century of genomics. <laughs> because I really do believe there are vivid examples of genomic medicine that are just starting to emerge. It is the tip of the iceberg, and there will be a lot more, but I think it is worth highlighting what some of these are, because I really believe that we are seeing genomic medicine come into focus in a fashion that actually even more exciting than when I spoke in the series a couple of years ago. And so I thought I would just quickly go through what these highlights are, because um, Bruce Korf will talk about them in much greater detail when he is here talking holistically about, um, about genomic medicine. But I thought in particular you may want to hear, especially from my perspective as director of the, of, the, of the Genome Institute, what do I think are sort of the hot areas in genomics and what are some of the programs we're doing to facilitate advances in those hot areas? Um, and so I'm going to just sort of, again, go through highlights. I'm going to highlight five areas that I think are the hottest ones um, in genomic medicine. I'll start with cancer because cancer is the hottest area in genomic medicine implementation. Um, um, I don't need to probably tell a sophisticated audience like this that cancer is a disease of the genome. Um, and what happens in cancer is that mutations get picked up by normal cells and eventually make those cells uh, grow out of control to become tumors. Um, but those mutations are sitting in the genomes of these tumors, and those genomes can be sequenced uh, just like a normal cell's genome can be sequenced. And with better and better methods for sequencing DNA, we can open up uh, these tumors' uh, uh, blueprint, its genome, read it out and begin to catalog all the sequence changes, and that's why efforts, like I mentioned, the Cancer Genome Atlas did exactly that. What that also can do then is start to give better and better information to diagnose cancer, and perhaps to think about better ways to treat cancer, and there is a remark, a whole incredible areas that I wouldn't, couldn't possibly represent. Um, I will say that in terms of actually changing the practice of medicine, since I'm trained as a pathologist actually, I do recognize the diagnostic potential is here. You know, as one example of many, uh, you know, for many, many decades, most cancer um, diagnostics involved histopathology as the major tool, um, and certainly that will continue, but I already am seeing, and, and for some kinds of cancer, that, that histopathology is augmented by genomic signatures that, and genomic profiles, if you will, of tumors that come out of machines like this and other machines, um, and uh, it's here and now. This is not hypothetical. Um, it is absolutely here and now for some types of cancer. And if you don't believe me, just watch television, go to websites and so forth. 
Uh, you will find a website such as that shown on the top. You will find, and may have seen, advertisements, and I keep seeing them all the time. They're increasing on, on, on television, um, whereby uh, from prominent uh, cancer treatment facilities talking about genomic this, genomic that, talking about the DNA of cancer care and so forth. This is mainstream. It's used for marketing because genomics is absolutely here to stay with respect to cancer diagnostics and cancer treatment. It is the lowest hanging fruit. I think another low-hanging fruit um, is the world of pharmacogenomics, pharmacology meeting genomics, recognizing that um, there is a reason why all of us respond differently. Uh, we respond differently to everything. Um, that's, I'm the guy on the left, okay, that's me. Uh, my children are like this, right? Um, actually, maybe it's a bad example because that might imply genetics that's not in play here, so maybe that's not a good example. But we all respond differently to everything. What I really am getting at is not roller coasters. What I'm really getting at is medications. Every medication in this pharmacy, in this hospital, at CVS, Walgreens, every one of those medications work. They just don't work in everyone. Um, but, and in fact, they are really often, often don't work. In fact, Nature had a, an article about this, which I thought was very interesting, just recent talking about the imprecise medicine. And here are sort of 10 very commonly prescribed medicines. And the person in blue in each case is the person where the medicine works. And the people in red are the number of people proportionally where the medicine doesn't work. Well, there's a lot of reasons why the medicines don't work, but a good part of that is the different ways that we metabolize drugs or how it affects us physiologically, much of which is due to variations in our genomes. And so the idea underlying all this, and we are learning more and more about this, is that we can take individuals with the same diagnosis, but do genomic profiling of them, get genomic information on them, and figure out who has variants that are going to make you a good responder or a not so good responder or even be a bad responder, and do that before you decide on what medication to give a person or what the dosage might be and so forth. So pharmacogenomics, here and now, recognized widely as something and will increase substantially over the next decade, which is why uh, Andy and Tara have Howard McLeod coming here, a regular um, in this series, to talk exclusively about pharmacogenomics on May 7th. Um, third highlight, here and now, actually this building is a great place to talk about it in, um, is the use of genomics to do rare genetic disease diagnostics. Um, the notion of having disease strike from nowhere, individuals with conditions that nobody seems to figure out what's wrong with them. But for a long, and in many cases, these individuals have major uh, amounts of resources spent trying to diagnose them, that the idea of just sequencing the genome as perhaps giving a clue just makes a whole lot of sense. So as Nature pointed out in this article, disorders not readily explained by standard tests can sometimes be diagnosed through genome sequencing analysis. And this sometimes it's about a quarter to a third of the time by today's methods. We'll find out what the diagnosis is by sequencing a genome. And the notion of undiagnosed diseases, undiagnosed conditions, really has come to the fore, um, actually deserving a lot of credit, activities taking place right here in this building. You know, patients on these long diagnostic odysseys going from doctor to doctor, medical center to medical center, nobody can figure out what's wrong with them. Uh, shown here is Bill Gall, who's our clinical director at our institute, but also is the leader of something called the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, which took place right here, started here in, in this, uh, the NIH Clinical Center, um, and really reduced to practice the idea of bringing these patients in um, and having a rigorous clinical evaluation in addition to a genomic analysis to try to see if you can figure out, get a diagnosis. And not that that yields a diagnosis every time, but it does um, um, quite frequently. And it has been a remarkably successful program um, and uh, is here and now and is mainstream and, in fact, has just been expanded, uh, recognizing its success. It is now a nationalized program. Um, NIH has its uh, pivotal role right here, but we now have established uh, through a common fund program called the Undiagnosed Diseases Network um, a series of other sites in the country um, who are doing similar work as well. Here and now, uh, genome analysis as part of diagnostics for rare, often undiagnosed conditions. Also here and now, in one case, um, and in another case being contemplated, certainly, is the genomics of, I package this understanding called genomics of pregnancy. It's actually two <coughs> stories in one. Uh, but genomics plays a big role now in pregnancy. There's something that's here and now, and something that I think is important to think about. Let me tell you each of these. The here and now is this. Uh, you know, we've been doing prenatal testing um, for many decades, actually, but we had to access fetal DNA. The way you access fetal DNA traditionally is through invasive procedures like amniocentesis, chorionic villus sampling. But with the new methods for sequencing DNA are so exquisitely sensitive 
that now we have, the community has figured out how to basically access that DNA that is, gets shed into the maternal bloodstream from the fetus. And that cell-free DNA can be accessed by a simple blood draw, a relatively non-invasive procedure. And so the idea of doing non-invasive prenatal genome sequencing and, and genome analysis is here and now. I mean, there's lots of literature about this. Um, in fact, it's winning lots of prizes over the past few years because it is changing the face of prenatal diagnostics um, and written about in the popular press um, as well. Um, recent data came out is just, I think, breathtaking. You think, oh, okay, there's a few people doing this. They get this blood draw and they get this. And no, no, not a few people worldwide. Millions of people worldwide. An article last year. You can see the rise in the use of non-invasive um, uh, methods involving genome analysis by simple blood draws in cell-free DNA of the fetus. You can see in aggregate it's well over a million and well on the route. It's expected to be well over a million um, in, in 2015. I haven't seen the numbers yet. Remarkable. Here and now is actually reducing mammocentesis coronavirus sampling substantially as a result. Here and now, prenatal uh, testing um, using genome sequencing. Not so here and now um, is this notion of the other end of pregnancy. You get a baby. You have a newborn. And Time Magazine thinks that by 2025, everyone's going to get their DNA mapped. I think they meant DNA sequenced, uh, but I'm not so sure. Um, and I think we want to think about that. Um, and it's an interesting um, notion, um, but it brings in a lot of logistical th concepts and challenges and certainly a lot of ethical ones as well. Do we want every child sequenced at birth have their genomic information carried with them, maybe in their electronic medical record for life? Not clear. Um, so we actually are studying this. We actually set up um, a program with the Child Health Institute to study this, to get a research foundation to think about these things. We have a series of sites that are now sequencing the genomes of newborns and asking how does it change their care. Um, and we'll learn a lot over the next five years. I will highlight one of these um, studies in particular, one of these sites um, is dealing with not healthy newborns. And here, uh, Nature talked about an article um, um, uh, that investigator is doing, which I think is remarkable, Stephen Kingsmore, where it has basically taking acutely ill children in the NICU, newborns in the NICU, where the doctors have basically given up, have no idea what's wrong with the child, know the child will, will die within a matter of days, and simply don't know what's wrong with them. And he's reduced to practice the idea of getting a small amount of blood and sequencing their genomes in less than a day, and getting information that in some cases, not always, but in some cases, gives insights about what's wrong, in some cases, saving the children, saving those newborns. And in fact, I think this is also going to become more commonplace uh, for acutely ill children in the, in the NICU where they simply don't know what's wrong with that child, quickly try to get a genome sequence. So another here and now. The last hot area is hot not because it's solved, but because it's really important. And it relates to the development of information systems that are connecting our knowledge of variants to their clinical relevance. And, and I really want to emphasize that generating a human genome sequence today is almost trivial. That is just not, it's not hard to read out the six billion G's, A's, T's, and C's of a given patient. What is really hard is then taking those six billion letters and rounding on the patient the next morning and having any clue what those variants mean. I mean, we just don't know the vast, vast, vast majority of those variants. We have no idea if they're clinically relevant or not. We need to fix that. There is a disconnect even between what we know in the scientific literature and what a busy healthcare professional is actually doing in terms of trying to manage the care of patients. So we believe that we need to create much more robust, and that's why it's hot, we need to create this acutely, a clinical genomics information systems, probably ones that integrate nicely with electronic health records, and also ones that deliver very clear guidelines to healthcare professionals in, in a very uh, simple way because they're going to be looking this up on these kinds of devices in a busy workflow of a nurse, of a pharmacist, of a physician's assistant, of a physician, and that needs to be done in a very robust fashion. The truth, though, is it doesn't exist. So we've put together a research network uh, called uh, the Clinical Genome Resource, or ClinGen, which you can read about in this paper, or look at this website, which is basically trying to scientifically figure out how do you build a knowledge base that could then be used by busy healthcare professionals. Um, and so we're at early stages. We're not even building it yet. We're just trying to figure out how do you take this explosion of literature about variants and which ones are medically important and which ones do you act on and which ones do you not do that and reduce it to something that could be looked up quickly so that you could have be a patient management be done efficiently um, with knowledge of that genomic information. So that's something to look for, but it's, we have a long way to go, but we're trying to facilitate it. So I want to transition before I spend the last 15 minutes talking about Sinelse and just point out that 
I've just described to you a, sort of a romp, if you will, um, through uh, you know, a progression over the last quarter century that just started with sinus, is audacious as just getting the sequence of the human genome, but now I was actually thinking about how are we actually going to use this information for clinical management, like I described in the last slide. And it actually is more complicated than that because what we have found as a community of scientists that were mostly basic scientists thinking about genome structure and function and evolution, now we're confronting the ecosystem of medicine. And the genomic medicine ecosystem is turning out, it's really complicated because anytime you go to change medical practice, you start touching lots of things that are really complicated. And that ecosystem is not healthy unless you think about all the things. So what do I mean by this? Well, well just think about healthcare delivery and reimbursements and all the aspects of changing clinical practice. It's like this word will show, it's really complicated. Parts of our institute, parts of the community are dealing with this. I'm not gonna talk about it, I'm just gonna point out to you that it's now becoming much bigger than we ever thought it was when we were just thinking about just the genome. You know, there's other aspects of this related to also education and genomic literacy. You know, we need, uh, we're, the language of genomics will be spoken as part of medical care. We need a, a, a literate public patients to go in. You can see here, starting to train the next generation of what this is all about. We also have a whole profession out there of physicians and physician's assistants and pharmacists and nurses. They all need to be literate in genomics. And how do you do that when they're at mid-career? Um, not just when you're getting them when they're being trained. And, and we're thinking about that. And these have huge complexities. Oh, and of course, we never thought about this stuff when the Genome Project began, but you know, there's a lot of regulatory oversight associated with any practice, any aspect of practicing medicine. And where genomics meets that regulatory oversight, there's a lot of stories and sub-stories there that we're dealing with. So I'm just mentioning these, not that I'm gonna talk about them, but just to point out that it really is complicated and sometimes it's almost daunting and overwhelming. So as you know, we draw nice graphics that get us over to actually changing the practice of medicine, you know, there's new surprises along the way and new mountains that we have to climb. And I will tell you at times, it can get very exhausting because all of a sudden we're dealing with the complexities of healthcare delivery on top of everything else. And you can get rather uh, pessimistic at times, but I, as I transition to my last topic, I do just want to point out, I like this quote because sometimes when I show this graphic, people say, oh my gosh, you're never going to do this. And I, I just think that a pessimist would have that view because a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity. I think our community of genomicists, uh, you know, we see this progression and we see the ecosystem and yes, it is daunting, but we don't get, we don't think of it as pessimistic. We see this as a great opportunity. Um, and I think this is why we keep pushing forward to see this progression become a reality, even when um, it really gets complicated. So let me transition now. I'm gonna spend the last 15 minutes um, on one last topic. And I think it is because it'll talk a little bit about the future. And the future is a reflection, I think, in many ways of the change of what we have seen um, in genomics, not about the science that I was described to you for the last little over an hour, but even just the relevance of genomics. It touches on even the ecosystem aspect I was just talking about. Because when genomics started, you know, 25, 30 years ago, this, it was a discipline just involving biomedical researchers. You know, I was one of those geeks just worrying about, you know, mapping and sequencing DNA. I think there was a pivotal transition when the Genome Project ended as we recruited healthcare professionals to start to work with us to think about how genomics might change, and we're starting to see the fruits of that. And the hot areas are real because health professionals are getting involved in thinking about how to use genomics. But I think the real change that's going on now um, is that patients are becoming relevant in this conversation, and therefore friends and relatives, uh, patients, friends and relatives of patients because genomics is becoming part of the language of cancer care, of pharmacogenomics, of rare diseases, and so forth. And you see it all the time in the news, on advertisements, and newspapers, and so forth. This is part of society now, and there's a lot of issues that become relevant. I touched on some of them, like education. Um, but there's a lot of issues even around public health. And so we think a lot about the societal implications and societal complications <coughs> of, of genomics and think about some of the public health aspects of it, which is why Colleen McBride uh, was invited to come here on March 23rd. She's gonna talk about more about some of these things. Um, but because this is becoming so relevant um, for all of us and seeing the great potential for this, I did think, I thought I, I would just use the last minutes to just update you about some breaking news. It's not that breaking anymore, but there's a lot happening here. Um, it was particularly breaking when it started um, in June of 2014, because it involved this guy. I hope all of you know who this man is. Um, and uh, besides being president of the United States, uh, this guy really likes science and he really likes genomics, I'm proud to say. 
And in June of 2014, he started some conversations, actually with Francis Collins, our director, around the idea of maybe launching a big project near the tail end of his presidency um, that might involve this vision of genomics, genomic medicine, individualizing patient care, and so forth, because he thought really could have great impact on the future, and he wanted to see what he could do in the last phases of his presidency. Um, those conversations evolved um, um, in the summer of 2014, uh, eventually getting framed around the concept of precision medicine. Um, and precision medicine you know, really sort of goes a step beyond genomic medicine. Genomic medicine would just be the, the G's, A's, T's, and C's shown here what precision medicine is being more precise by starting to account for things like environmental exposure and lifestyle, um, diet, and, and, and things like that, other aspects of our life that we might be able to use as information to be more precise for medical care. It is uh, just a broader context for individualizing medical care to advance human health. And what the president saw as a great potential, um, and uh, aided by people who he spoke to, uh, began again a great appreciation for the idea that, you know, today, we really do most of our medical care based on the expected results of the average patient. Almost everything we do is based on the average patient. But the world is changing, and there could be a tomorrow where we could be more precise if we would only account for individual genomic differences, environmental differences, lifestyle differences, and have that as a way to be uh, uh, more precise in, in preventing and treating diseases. And, uh, and the president really just wanted to know how could you get from today to tomorrow. Um, and so a series of, of strategic planning efforts went on, actually quite small, but important over the small numbers of people because the president wanted this quiet um, during the summer of 2014, leading to sort of plans that emerged here at NIH and other parts of the federal government. In the fall of 2014, uh, the president was presented this plan. There's actually a picture from that meeting. You can see Francis uh, here, other very important people I won't go through. A meeting that took place in October of 2014 uh, where this plan was discussed and then the president got fully behind it announced it in the State of the Union address in um, early 2015, and then formally announced it here, uh, and shown here in these pictures from the East Room of the White House. These are photographs I got to take, uh, sitting center um, and fairly close to the podium, um, where the President announced uh, January 2015 the launch of this thing called the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, at the exact time that the President announced this in January of 2015, the New England Journal published this paper um, describing, it's actually the only scientific paper officially coming out describing the general framing of the Precision Medicine Initiative uh, by Francis Collins and then NCI Director Harold Varmus. If you haven't read this, I encourage you to read it. Um, Harold was an author in part because there's going to be a major cancer genomics along the lines of what I said, part of the Precision Medicine Initiative. I'm not going to describe that now. I just thought I would briefly describe the other major element you'll be hearing a lot about in the coming, next coming months, actually hopefully the coming years and even decades. And that relates to the Precision Medicine Initiative's launching of a U.S. national research cohort. The idea is to collect and uh, recruit and enlist uh, millions of people, at least a million, hopefully more, uh, U.S. volunteers um, who will agree to participate in this uh, hopefully multi-decade uh, project and program where the participants are going to share genomic data, lifestyle information, biological samples. All of this will be linked to their electronic health records. And this is a big kind of project that not only aims to do incredible studies, but also to forge new models for how science is done. Um, the idea is to do this in a fashion that fully engages the participants, uh, shares the data very openly in a very genomics-like way of having data sharing, um, and also to, of course, make sure that all their privacy is adequately protected. The notion of having such a big program of involving many years studying lots and lots of people actually isn't brand new. Um, uh, none other than Francis Collins, when he had the job I currently have about a decade ago, actually called for this in a commentary that he wrote in 2004. So you may wonder, well, why did we bring back to the president a, a decade later an idea that was a decade old that never went anywhere? Because it turned out when this got proposed in 2004, it just didn't get any traction, in part because it was a little too early um, and it was a little too expensive. But the world had changed in the intervening decade, which is why we brought a new one a new version of this was brought back to the president um, um, in, in, 20, uh, fifth, in 2014, why it got traction then. And let me just briefly tell you why the world has changed in the last 10 years, and it very much overlaps with some of the things I've described earlier. You know, compared to uh, a decade ago, genomics has changed. I mean, think about all the things I've described, the cost of sequencing genomes, our understanding of the genome, our understanding of variants, and so forth. So genomics, breathtaking changes in the last decade, um, and, and that sort of has been very influential 
for the launch of the Precision Medicine Initiative. But there's other areas, electronic health records. Electronic health records are critical for what's going to be done to capture this information electronically. But a decade ago, um, it was only about 20% of healthcare professionals and settings had electronic health records. That's why you couldn't, you, what didn't exist, the infrastructure didn't exist in 80% of places to collect the information. Now that figure is over 95% in the US of healthcare sites. And then meanwhile, we have done a lot to learn how to marry genomic information with electronic uh, record information and other information feeding into electronic health records. Uh, we have a, of a program that's been going on since 2007 called Emerge for Electronic Medical Records and Genomics, which has really taught us a tremendous amount of how we might be able to capitalize on genomic information, electronic uh, medical record information, and other information in electronic medical records. And that has served as, in some ways, a pilot for what's being envisioned for the Precision Medicine Initiative. But meanwhile, what the President also, and every, in the Congress, by the way, who's now funding this, got very enthusiastic about is the recognition that it's even beyond genomics into other technologies. And, and better and better ways of measuring physiology and environmental exposures and, and lifestyle. And, you know, this idea of, and I'll show you a paper just from last year, you know, the, all these new sensors, these M Health devices that, that, that measure all sorts of things about our physiology, our, our various analytes, um, our cardiovascular system, and so forth. This is all sort of just at early stages. And many people uh, you know, wear Fitbits. Those are recreational devices, they're awesome, but much more robust technologies are coming. One could imagine harnessing uh, uh, the power of those technologies, having these individuals wear these devices, collect the data, and have that data streaming in to central data resources for scientists to analyze. Oh, by the way, it'll stream in through their smartphones, which a decade ago, um, uh, about only about a million smartphones existed. Only 2% of Americans carried a smartphone a decade ago, but now over 60% of Americans carry a smartphone. So one could imagine having an immense amount of genomic data, electronic health record data, mobile health data, all streaming in on a million or more people, and that will create an amazingly rich data resource. But it also means we have a lot of data analysis to do, and data science will become a prominent feature of this. But you know what? As uh, Tira and Andy are going to continue to tell you in subsequent lectures, we're in a new world here. Uh, data science is front and center in biomedical research. Compute power has gone up 160-fold in the last decade. And uh, we're, you know, we're not totally ready, but we're going to have to be ready because this is what we're going to be doing as biomedical researchers. But the last element, which I do think will be interesting to, and important to watch that will make this different, is the, the notion of how we will engage the individuals who will be part of the Precision Medicine Initiative and the cohort in particular. Uh, these people will not be subjects, they're not going to be patients, they're going to be partners. And uh, the reason they're going to be partners is that studies have shown and continue to show that actually most Americans want to participate in biomedical research, but they only want to participate if they are sort of engaged from the beginning, um, that they know what's happening to their data, they get to opt in and out to things along the way, and if they're treated as partners. And uh, from the very beginning of the planning, uh, the participants are being featured as uh, partners in the scientific enterprise. And I think the whole social media, Facebook era is very important here in how we will engage them through social media, through smartphones and so forth. And it'll be a new way of doing science. I can tell you there's a lot of cohorts that have been created in the United States. This one's going to be unlike any of the ones uh, that have preceded it. So there's a lot associated with this. If you want to read the current blueprint for the Precision Medicine Initiative cohort, there's a, a working group report um, that uh, you can read. And for you, actually, the URL will be here. It's a very convenient URL to keep in mind. This is the landing page for the initiative, which hopefully will exist for the next 10 and 20 years or 30 years, because a lot of information about the initiative is being put uh, to make this a very transparent process on the landing page for the NIH, uh, NIH's effort in the Precision Medicine Initiative. So I, I wanted to end by sort of tying it all together because it was actually very interesting. Um, the Precision Medicine Initiative sort of gives me a very interesting sense of uh, deja vu because there are a lot of things we don't really know how it's going to play out. It is an audacious, yet another audacious effort. And there's so many uncertainties associated with it. And it happens to be happening exactly 25 years or so. Um, after the launch of the Human Genome Project. And if you would have asked me, and I was there, the day the Genome Project started, if you would have asked me, well, how exactly are you going to map and sequence the human genome? I would have said, I have no idea. 
but it just is a compelling goal, and I think we can do it, and we'll figure it out as we go. And exactly what we did in getting the Human Genome Project completed. We set audacious goals, and we were willing to change course as needed, and I'm telling you, it feels exactly the same now, 25 years later, with the Precision Medicine Initiative, we're launching it, it's audacious, it has these goals, we've never done anything like this before, and there's so many details, if you ask me or the people who are going to be organizing it on the front line, they'll say, well, we haven't really figured that one out yet, but, we'll, we'll, but that's okay, because they'll figure it out as we go. I think these, the comparison is sort of a, and, and, and the Precision Medicine Initiative will go on longer, actually, than the Genome Project, I predict, um, but it's that same audacious willingness to sort of change mid-course that I think is absolutely required in order for it to be successful. Um, and so this is, I gave you that bit at the end because I think it's very exciting to watch and, and, and maybe some of you will participate in this either as part of the cohort or as researchers analyzing the data, and I hope that you do. And there'll be a lot of news coming out in the coming weeks and months about it as we stand this initiative up um, um, in the next year or two. Um, lastly, if the topics I talked about and, and programs I talked about are of interest to you, I will shamelessly plug this because it's free. Um, I put out a weekly, uh, not a weekly, that would kill me, um, a monthly a newsletter um, uh, that uh, the Institute staff helped me put together um, that highlight things along the lines of what I described here. And if you want to get that, feel free to follow the link on this and you can subscribe to it and get a monthly newsletter from me. So I realize I am coming up exactly on the time that was allocated to me. So I will end there and I would encourage uh, anybody who needs to leave, they should leave and maybe people who have questions should just come down and see me at the podium so that we can finish the official session in an hour and a half. Thank you.